Well, good morning. It's uh, nice to be speaking with you again uh, in this, the uh, first of uh, the new series that we're doing uh, called Epic Fail. Um, I don't know what it says about me that uh, Chris thought that I should be the first one to speak about this topic, but um, there you go. Uh, I wonder if you've ever had one of those I can't believe that just happened moments. One of, the, um, one of the first clients that I ever appeared for in court, we'll call him Harry, uh, was a pet shop owner. And uh, Harry loved his animals and he took good care of them, but he otherwise sucked at running a pet shop. Uh, he was an admin nightmare. He was behind in all of his insurances he didn't keep proper ledgers of the animals that he had and that he didn't have. Uh, he had a pretty relaxed attitude to keeping locks on cages and things like that. Um, and one of his biggest problems was that for half of the animals that he was selling, uh, he didn't have any licenses for them. He just didn't bother to go and get them. Um, nice guy, but kind of hopeless. Anyway, after a number of warnings, uh, the Department of Agriculture says, uh, look, you, you've got to shape up. So they charge him. They issue him with a number of charges, and off Harry has to go down to the local magistrate's court. Um, and uh, his lawyer on that day, for better or worse, uh, is me. And uh, I had been admitted to practice for about five minutes, and um, green as the hills, but my boss at the time, who was a bit of a thrill seeker, uh, decided he'd give me Harry's case. He says, look, um, just go down, cut your teeth, okay? Uh, he's going to be pleading guilty. So just go down and try and get him out of there for as little as you can. Um, it's, you can't stuff it up. It'll be like falling off a log. Challenge accepted. Uh, I was nervous but keen, so um, I meet up with Harry at court, and uh, we'd already spoken and worked through what we're going to say. And um, we go into the courtroom, and the prosecutor from the department is there, and uh, she reads out all of the charges. There's about 30 of them. The magistrate looks at me. Uh, and he's not amused. And he says, Mr Khan, um, I'm going to go and have my morning cup of tea. But he says, when I come back, you better be able to tell me some positive things about this guy, uh, because he's otherwise on track to get a whopping fine. Anyway, duck out of court, have another chat to Harry. And uh, I say, listen, uh, is there anything else you can tell me about yourself? I said, are there any, any public deeds that you mean, any good acts of community service? Harry scratches his head, he thinks for a minute, and he goes, yes, yes, now that you mention it, there is. He goes, uh, my son's school, a couple of times a year, I take all of the animals in there and I do some presentations. The kids love it. It goes beautifully. I think, bingo, how good is this? Anyway, we go back into court, and uh, the matter's called again, and I, uh, the, I get to my feet. I say all of the things that I was going to say about Harry, you know, all of the efforts that he's making to try and, or not to try and smarten up his business. And then I come to the good bit. Uh, and I don't mind saying to you, friends, I painted a picture. I painted a picture. There were birds chirping. There were children squealing with delight. There were puppies as far as the eye could see, fluffy kittens, grateful teachers. Uh, and this guy looked, sounds like Dr. Doolittle by the time that I'm finished. <laughs> eh? Anyway, uh, I sit down confident of success and feeling good about my stratospheric career to come. Anyway, the magistrate's nodding approvingly and he turns to the prosecutor and he says to her, well, is there anything you want to say in reply to that? Sounds pretty good. Anyway, the prosecutor uh, pauses for a moment and uh, then she says, uh, yes, Your Honour, there is. She gets to her feet uh, with a smile on her face that unnerved me and um, she says, Your Honour, Mr Khan has made some very fine points, painted a very lovely picture. There's just one thing you need to know. You need a licence to take animals into a school. <laughs> and Mr Harry here, he doesn't have one. Thankfully, the magistrate, who I think could appreciate a good dose of irony, gave Harry a modest fine, told him to sharpen up, and send him on his way. Harry nicks off, happy as anything, but I am left sitting there feeling like an absolute dill going, I can't believe that just happened. 
How did I miss that? How did I miss to ask that with that guy? I can't believe I stuffed that up so badly. It would be nice uh, if I could say that my I can't believe I just did that history was only confined to moments like those with Harry, where in the end it turned out okay. Yet my life, much like yours, I suspect, is and has been full of them. I can't believe I just did that. I can't believe I just said that. I can't believe I just reacted that way. I can't believe that's how I responded in that moment. Again and again and again. In each week of this series, we're going to be focusing on a different account in the Bible of people who have absolutely blown it. If you gave them a report card for their efforts, that big red ugly stamp up there would be all over it. The one thing that's comforting about the Bible is that uh, it is absolutely full of human failure and makes no effort to hide it. The people in Scripture, even the ones that we admire, are frequently making an absolute hash of life. And we see them left standing there going, what just happened? What just happened? I can't believe I just did that. Over the coming weeks, uh, each week is going to focus on a different area of the ways in which we sometimes fail. But today, we're going to start at the very beginning with perhaps no better example of those than who are guilty of the first epic fail ever, Adam and Eve, the ones who set the pattern for the rest of us to come. They are our travelling companions in this little introduction today. But lest we be misled by the title, the important thing for us to remember throughout this series is that this is not just a story about failure. That is not even the main focus of the message. This is ultimately the story of God. The story of the way in which God unfolds through every single one of these people that we're going to look at. And the way he unfolds through us, his love, his faithfulness, his kindness, his forgiveness, his justice, his mercy and his grace. And he does it through you and me. Let's pray before we start. Father, as we come to your word this morning, we declare that you are the God of heaven and earth. And we remind ourselves, Lord, that by faith we understand that the universe uh, and everything in it, including us, was made at your command. Everything in creation that now is, has been, and ever will be, came first from the command of your voice, let there be. We remember that you made us, Lord, that you looked upon us, upon all you had made, and you said it is very good. And so as we begin this conversation on failure, Lord, with all that that might bring up for us, would you speak to us? Let us see more of who you are, and in doing so, let us see more of who we are in you. In Jesus' name. Amen. If you want to turn to the opening chapters of Genesis for where we begin. So Adam and Eve, we begin in Eden. Start of Genesis, God has created the heavens and the earth, and it is so good. Day, night, sun, moon, stars, sky, sea, land, birds, animals, creatures that crawl along the ground, livestock that walk the land. Everything. And humankind, male and female, made in God's image. Every single thing is brought forth by God's command and everything as it should be. This is paradise. While Adam and Eve have this wondrous bounty of creation to enjoy, what they have, precious beyond all else, is the pure, unhindered joy of access to the presence of God. That is what makes this paradise, that God is in this garden sanctuary with them, that he dwells with them there. We pick up in the text of Genesis 2. Now the Lord, put this up here, in case you haven't got your Bibles. Now the Lord, now how do I go back? Sorry, folks. Now the Lord had planted a garden in the east in Eden, and there he put the man he had formed. The Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. Take notice of this. The garden is full of trees. 
that looked great and were good for food. In the middle of the garden were the tree of life uh, and the knowledge of good and evil. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and to take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will certainly die. Pausing here, certainly die does not mean that they will drop dead on the spot if they eat the fruit. That's not what it means. What the text intends is that death, both spiritual and eventually physical, will be the inevitable consequence of their actions. We then read down further at verse 25 that Adam and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. When we pause to think about it, there are multiple different types of failure. Multiple kinds of ways that we can fail. Not all of them are bad. Uh, take, for instance, um, let us say that Danesy and I are the number one and the number two tennis champions in the world, as improbable as that might seem. And we're just varying between number one and number two and we're playing in the Australian Open and uh, we're each giving it our best. You can go as far, as deep into the fifth set as you can. Only one of us is going to succeed. The other is going to fail, though everyone has tried their best. By definition, someone fails. I am not now, uh, nor ever will be, a member of the Australian Ballet Company. Even if I were inclined to do so, Age, physique, time and ability are all firmly against me. I can huff and puff and pirouette to my heart's content. I am never going to be dancing in Swan Lake. <laughs> Despite my best efforts, I will fail at that endeavour. To give one more example, I don't know if you guys have ever played the board, uh, the go the board game Snakes and Ladders. My boys are massively into it. My youngest, Sammy, wins it... Um, so freakishly often that it just defies all probabilities. But at the end of the day, Snakes and Ladders is a game in which there is zero skill required. You are literally at the mercy of the dice as to whether you go up or down. You can fail, you can fail miserably at it, and there's not a thing you can do about it. Failure takes many forms, we know that it does. And yet, when I say the word failure, you know instinctively what I mean. You know what I'm talking about. When we, by our words or our actions, have fallen short of a standard, that's the failure that conjures to our minds. That might be a standard that we impose upon ourselves, a standard that's imposed upon us from our parents, that we got from them, from our friends, from our employer, from the culture. Regardless, we fail when we don't meet a mark that is set for us when we had the choice and the opportunity to do otherwise. When we're left thinking, I've made a choice here and I've blown it. The biblical understanding of failure is captured in the word sin. Sin, put one way, is the denial of God as our creator, of Jesus as the rightful king and the Lord of our lives. This denial is expressed by the way we think, by the way we speak, by the way we act. In Romans it says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The Book of Common Prayer puts it this way in the uh, order of the morning prayer. It says, we have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against thy holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done. And we have done those things which we ought not to have done. In the passages we just read a moment ago, Adam and Eve could not accuse God of being vague. He was perfectly clear, both in his commands and in the consequences that would follow if it were broken. The whole garden is yours. It is yours to take care of and to enjoy and to be nourished by. Go for it. Just do not eat from that one tree. If you do, Death, separation will follow. Adam and Eve were clear on what ought to be done and what ought not 
to be done. Before we get to the part that we all know comes next, it is worth turning to the question that might be asked, if this is paradise, pure and holy good, why the tree you can't eat from? Why the presence of the serpent who is about to stick his head up? Eugene Peterson, in his excellent book, uh, Leap Over a Wall, puts it this way. He says that we sin so frequently as a puzzle, for our lives are always diminished in the process. But our capacity for sin is no puzzle. It is required by the nature of love and freedom, the twin aspects of our humanity in which we become what we were created to be. A coerced love is hardly love. And enforced freedom is no freedom. If God is serious about creating us to experience his love and to love freely, to experience his freedom and to freely love, then there must be the capacity to not love, to not be free. When we exercise those options negatively, regardless of the forms in which those acts come to expression, we're sinners. There is always choice, friends, even in paradise. Love that is empty of choice, that is empty of will, that is empty of the option to stop loving, is not love at all. We move into chapter 3 and here we find um, the main antagonist, the serpent. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say... You may not eat from any tree in the garden. Pause there. See how the serpent is undermining God immediately out of the gate with a lie. God had only ever said that one tree was off limits. Notice the subtlety of it though. And we might notice here that often the devil doesn't have to entice us with big sins. Often it's enough to lead us off stray by just to do a slight twist, a slight perversion of the truth that God gives us, a slight twist on the gifts that he gives us. The woman said to the snake, we may eat from the trees in the garden, uh, but God did say you must not eat from the tree that is in the middle of the garden and you must not touch it or you will die. You will not certainly die, the snake said uh, to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. Pause here again. Note how we'd seen before every tree in the garden was pleasing to the eye and had fruit good to eat. It didn't have to be this tree. The garden was full of them. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they realised that they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. A few years ago I was reading a sermon by the American preacher uh, Paige Benton Brown and I came across a line that has stuck with me ever since. And it was this. Life has no tragedy like our God ignored. Life has no tragedy like our God ignored. And boy, does that sound out here. One could ask, what's the problem with eating the fruit? Isn't wisdom desirable? It is. But the problem here is that's not, that is not what is on offer. You can know the difference between good and evil and not have wisdom. That is not how it's being packaged to Eve. Aside from inviting the humans to doubt God's goodness, the snake's sales pitch is that they are missing out, that they too can be godlike. Why should God get it all to himself? Why should they rely on God when they can carve their own path forward? Whenever God is displaced as the Lord of our lives, the self usually takes his place. We move from God-led to being self-governed. The problem for us, however, to state the obvious, is that we're not God. Once we're no longer listening to God, we're generally taking our cues from the culture around us. 
We're on the one hand told by the culture to be ourselves, to live our best life, to speak our own truth, to have no regrets. And those things are themselves impossibly ludicrous standards. Truth measured by what? The best life measured by what? Regret measured by what? The irony becomes clear because on the other hand, we are constantly being bombarded with messages about how we need to have the right type of opinions, the right type of politics, the right kind of car, the right kind of house, the right kind of holiday locations, the right kind of share portfolio, the right kind of clothes, the right kind of body, the right kind of spouse, the right kind of kids. The culture we live in is not a failure-free zone, folks. It is soaked in it. We are constantly being asked to prove that we're worthy. And if you manage to prove that you're worthy by those standards, you're told to keep proving that you're worthy or you're out. You fall behind. This becomes awfully difficult because the standard of meeting the mark today is not necessarily the standard of meeting the mark tomorrow. That's the problem when we become our own gods. We are crushed under the weight of the standards that we and others set for us. Rather than worshipping and following the one eternal God who is unchanging, whose measure never changes, is there from beginning to end, we become subject to the impossibly shifting, judgmental and often hypocritical standards of our day. Adam and Eve had nothing to prove in Eden. They had nothing to prove. They belonged to Yahweh. He was their God. And that was enough until it wasn't. It wasn't until the serpent sowed discontent in them and suggested that they should somehow try and be contrary to how they were made to be that things go wildly off course. Turning then to how Adam and Eve respond, we get the two primary blueprints for what we tend to do as humans when we don't uh, wish to deal with our failures properly. Number one, we hide. And number two, we blame. We hide. Adam and Eve, um, for the first time ever, immediately experience guilt and shame. They become aware that they're naked. They now feel exposed in a way they have never felt before. They feel to use Peterson's words before, diminished by what they have done. And so their first instinct is to hide. Now, we're going to hear more about our tendency to run and hide from our failures next week. But it's enough for us to note now that we haven't lost our tendency to duck for cover when confronted with our failures. Sometimes we can be so ashamed, so embarrassed, so hopeless about what we've done that confronting it feels beyond what we can bear. So we hide. We hide behind denials. We hide behind silence. We hide behind lies. We hide behind pride and bravado. We hide behind the multitude of ways that we numb ourselves senseless. Alcohol, drugs, porn, gambling, compulsive shopping, hour after hour after hour of Netflix, just gluing ourselves to our devices, busyness, even God busyness, anything to avoid tackling the elephant in the room. And we blame. <clears throat> it's hard not to award the gong for the most galling response here to Adam. He gets both pistols out. Not only does he throw Eve under the bus and he says, the woman, the woman... But he has a crack at God as well. The woman who you put here with me. Your fault, your fault. Blame all around, except at him. Not only is he right there with Eve when it happens, when the snake is speaking to her, he is the one that God first gives the commandment to. He is the first one to receive it. 
first to receive, but the last to be on deck to take in the accountability. And Eve, well, what Eve says is true. She was, in a sense, deceived. She, by her own words, though, to the snake, knew the way she'd been told to walk and chooses not to. We often love a good blame game, don't we? Love a good blame game. If we need any further evidence of this, we need only to look to the tone of our politics, to the tone of our social discourse, to the tone of our media. But they're reflective of us. We love a good blame game. We blame each other. We blame God. We blame our circumstances. We blame our upbringing. We blame the conditions. We blame the economy. Ultimately, blame says the responsibility for what has happened here is not really on me. It's on X. Insert something else. No wonder Jesus in encouraging us to move away from this pattern, says, look first to the plank in your own eye before the speck in someone else. As we know, God tells the serpent, Adam and Eve, how their lives are going to look from then on. Each of them received dire consequences for what has just happened. And the humans are then expelled from the garden. Adam and Eve cannot stay there. They cannot stay there and live forever in that state. So whilst God's expulsion of them from Eden is a discipline, it's a mercy as well. It is the only way to begin the path of redemption. Sin often has painful and unavoidable consequences. We know that. We know um, that there is no getting around that. We cannot get real about our failures without accepting that certain things may flow from it. But we also know that's not the end. We know that's not the end because we've read the rest of the book. We've read beyond Genesis 3. We've read all the way to the other end of it. We know that in the end, our failures are not the end of us. They are not the final word. We know that God relentlessly pursues his people, making his presence known to them and all the while unfolding his plan to restore their dwelling with him. And we know that we have that presence available here to us now by his spirit. When Jesus Christ was hanging on the cross, there were two thieves also being crucified with him, one either side. Luke records one of them as carrying on at Jesus like an absolute banana, mocking him. Are you not the Christ? Are you not the Christ? Save yourself. Save yourself. And while you're there, save us. Come on, get into it. Prove that you're worthy. More bluster, more bravado. But the other thief sees Jesus very differently. He sees that Jesus is different. He perceives that Jesus is already worthy. He shouts out to the other criminal, you and I deserve to die. We've done what we've done, but this man, he is innocent. For that thief, there's no more hiding. There's no more blaming. This is the end of the road. This man has come to a place where he is totally honest about who he is and what he deserves. But he sees in Jesus that his failures are not the end of him. The Romans might have put him up on that cross, but there next to him is the author of life himself, the only one who has the ultimate say over who this man is. Luke records, then he says, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus answered him, truly, I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. I don't, you don't need to keep trying to measure up. I don't need to keep trying to prove that I'm worthy because I know I'm not, but he is. And because he is, I know that my many failures, our many failures, 
our prides, our lusts, our anger, our betrayals, our greed, our arrogance, our resentment, our abuses. None of them, no matter how epic they are, are the end of us. None of them need to define us. I'm defined, you're defined by the one who has already been proven worthy. As the band come up to the stage, can I encourage you, take this series of messages in the coming weeks seriously, please. As you're praying through it, ask God, are there any failures I'm needing to address? Am I hiding? Am I blaming? Ask him to help you. Ask him to help put failure in its proper place for you. Above all, can I encourage you to ask yourself this. Am I trying to show that I'm worthy? Or am I living to show that Jesus is worthy? When Jesus says to that thief, you will be with me in paradise, that word paradise in the Greek is paradisos. It means the garden place. The same word used in the Greek Old Testament for Eden. The same word used in Revelation 2.7 where it is written, To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. This thief comes openly and honestly to Jesus, acknowledges him for who he is, and he receives the most precious thing of all, the promise of the presence of God. Jesus says, you will be with me. And he's with us, he's with you. Let's pray as we begin to worship him now. Lord, we thank you for Jesus and we declare that he is worthy. We declare that he is our living hope. Thank you that we don't need to strive to keep trying to measure up to the standards that shift and move like the sands. We remind ourselves, Lord, that our one and only measure is you. Keep us from hiding, Lord God. Keep us from blame. For those of us stuck in failures, Lord, um, with no, perhaps no real sense of the way out at this moment, would you please light the next steps forward, God? Give us courage to step toward you, not away. Father, we thank you for your great love for us. We thank you for your love for us from beginning to end. We thank you that you don't stop pursuing us, that you don't stop desiring to bring us into your presence. You never stop wanting us to come to you, to be our God and for us to be your people. Lord, as we enter this time of worship now, fill us afresh with a fresh sense of your spirit and a hope in who you are. In Jesus' name.